All right, welcome to week three, video nine. So this week, all we've been doing is reading uh, from Evicted, and we didn't really read that much, but I've been trying to go into some more detail about um, the economics of what's going on in the trailer park and in Sharina's properties on the north side. Uh, so for this final video, I want to talk about the role of government in all of this and then tie it back to um, the stuff that we were reading by Iris Marion Young. All right. So to review, we've got um, a narrative of some different families and we've got information about the big picture. Chapters one and two were on the north side. Um, where we see Arlene um, get evicted twice and then winding up in one of Sharina's apartments, and then Lamar actually being evicted from one of Sharina's apartments. And we learned about the role of housing and the basic thesis that housing plays a bigger role in the creation of poverty than we realize. We see how rent takes up a huge portion of people's income. Um, and there's also this background fact that um, basically none of the buildings th that we're dealing with are up to code and all of the tenants are behind on rent. So we've got this sort of legal situation where everything is, um, uh, everyone is already in violation of the law, right? And that sets up the power dynamic. We move to the trailer park um, and we see evictions, uh, Lorraine is threatened with eviction uh, for talking to the press. Uh, retaliation was a theme that we've been seeing. Ned and Pam get evicted, which lead to Scott and Teddy getting evicted. And um, the contagiousness of eviction, the way that eviction can destabilize whole neighborhoods is an important theme. In general, though, we see that residents of the trailer park tend to stand behind the trailer park owner, Tobin. Um, and some of this seems to be based on fear of moving to the north side, the black north side, or a desire to think of their trailer park as different than the north side ghettos. Also in this chapter, we get these chapters, we get some of the history of segregation and anti-black violence in Milwaukee. Uh, which is important and applies generally to all sorts of older Great Lakes cities, including Cleveland, Lorraine, Elyria. And we talked about how evicting people is a way to assert control over land, and again, how eviction destabilizes um, individuals and communities. I made you watch a John Oliver video, um, and, you know, uh, John Oliver may or may not be to your taste in comedy, but he raises several important points here about the financing of trailer parks. Um, the big points are just that mobile homes don't really move, and they go down in value, right? Um, they can move, maybe 20% of them ever move, but that may, makes their value go down even quicker. And so in general, you don't want to do what Tobin is asking his residents to do, buy a trailer home without buying the land underneath. This is, in fact, such a bad deal that Tobin will just give you the mobile home um, as long as he controls the land underneath. In general, um, in the John Oliver video, we saw that trailer park owners profit from the fact that their tenants are trapped but also, the good, the good news, there are cases where um, tenants of trailer parks organize to buy the park. Um, that seems to be something that is far from the minds of Tobin's trailer park residents, but it wasn't far from the minds of the residents of one of Frank Rolfe's trailer parks in Texas. All right, so now we move to chapters five and six, which is the end of the reading for today. We get more backstory on Arlene's family. Um, we also see a woman named Trisha move into the unit upstairs from Arlene. Trisha is a former uh, homeless crack addict. 
She used to sleep with men just to have a place to sleep. Uh, she bonds really quickly with um, Arlene uh, by lying for her to a, a previous resident. But it's not even clear that she th realizes what she's doing is a lying. She just makes up a relationship and um, she may even believe it. We also see more about the Hingstons. Uh, the Hingstons were a stabilizing influence on their old neighborhood. And uh, they're not a stabilizing influence on their new neighborhood. And so this again gets, that, gets to that theme where um, uh, eviction destabilizes not just individuals, but communities. The other thing we, we see in this chapter that's really important is um, this observation that rent is actually just as high in Milwaukee in the rich neighborhoods as it is in the poor neighborhoods. There's not much of a difference in rent. And um, Desmond asserts that this has been true since the 19th century. Um, when I tried to research this fact for areas in Northeast Ohio, my results were more mixed. Um, and this might be a research project that you could do, which I think is interesting. But nevertheless, it's clear in Milwaukee that um, landlords are making their money by neglecting repairs for tenants who have fallen behind on rent. So the rents are high, just as high as they are in the wealthy neighborhoods, not because um, the landlords think that the tenants can pay. In fact, just the opposite. The landlords want to trap the tenants in debt so that they can skimp on repairs. So that's where we are in the, in, in the primary book. Well, I, want to, I want to talk about some philosophy for a second, right? This is actually a philosophy course. When we were looking at um, the article by Iris Marianne Young, she talked about social structures and structural injustices. So a social structure, she, there was a bunch of things that she said were true of it. And I gave examples of McDonald's as a social structure and uh, Lorain County Community College as a social structure. I just want to talk about three of the features that she mentions there. Um, historical structures involve social roles that are stable, interactive routines that you're supposed to participate in if you're in those roles, and then mobilized resources. A structural injustice, according to Young, was an injustice caused by a social structure that many people participate in. So the thing to note here is that housing is actually a social structure. It has roles, tenant and landlord. It has interactive routines, paying rent, asking for repairs to be done, being evicted. And, and there are mobilized resources. The housing itself is a mobilized resource. The sheriff's office that can evict you is a mobilized resource. The welfare office that can help out the tenants is a mobilized resource. The homeless shelter, they call it the lodge, is a mobilized resource. So let's talk about the government now. This is important. The government has a role in creating and sustaining almost every part of this social structure. So, I mean, think about the structure, right? We've got mobilized resources. The housing itself is a mobilized resource, but the housing is a product of the government. It, you have buildings that are built to uh, building codes, uh, and you have to get building permits to do them, and often you have government-backed loans. The way the government enforces building codes and issues building permits totally controls this social structure. The sheriff's office is a government office. The welfare office is a government office. The homeless shelter, the lodge, is actually run by the Salvation Army, and almost every, every part of the Salvation Army actually receives government funding. 
We also have interactive routines, right? And all of these are government enforced. You pay rent, that's enforced by the government. You can ask for repairs and you might have some legal resource and recourse in demanding those repairs, or you might not, depending upon the situation. Um, but again, that's um, backed by the government. If you are evicted, that is a government action. The sheriff's office, uh, the sheriff comes to evict you, right? One way of thinking about what's going on here is that we are dealing with something that in philosophy we call social construction. And that might sound like a weird, scary phrase, especially if you've heard it bantered around by people who um, don't really understand what it is, but it's really a very simple thing. So to understand social construction, you just have to think about the difference between physical reality and social reality. Physical reality is things like the Rio Grande. Um, it's a river. It's created by a process. It's created by the water cycle, a process of evaporation and and, and precipitation. Um, the important thing about physical reality is that it doesn't go. It it doesn't go away if you stop believing in it. You can say I don't believe in the Rio Grande, but it will still be there. The water will still circulate. Social realities is different. Social reality will go away. It is in some way dependent on people's beliefs. You have to have enough of the right people believing, uh, believing in social reality to maintain it. And once that faith is lost, the social reality disappears. So when people talk about social construction, it's, this is generally what they mean. The point is, that th our lives are full of things that we think of as just natural facts about the world, as given as the Rio Grande. Um, but these aren't natural facts about the world. They're created facts. And the whole business of social change is a matter of getting people to see something that they used to see as a natural fact that wasn't worth criticizing because it's just there, see that as a changeable fact that is worth criticizing because it is under our control. So basically, the social roles involved with being a tenant and a landlord these are constructed, these are social constructions, and part of how they are socially constructed is through action by the government. So the last thing I want to leave you with, or second to last thing, um, is the other lesson from um, Iris Marion Young's essay. She said that we're used to thinking about responsibility in terms of what she called the liability model. Um, and this, is, this was the model where we hold people accountable for things that they have done as individuals. So I cause this and therefore I am responsible for this. Um, and if that was a harm and that was unjust, I am punished. It's, an it's a model based on looking at what individuals have done in the past. Political responsibility is about social structures that we all participate in and our collective responsibility for them and it's future looking. We want to change them um, it, it, going forward in the future. So let's return to the big picture from, um, uh, from this chapter in Matthew Desmond's book. He mentions, welfare in Milwaukee has not budged since 1997, right? He's writing in 2016. A housing voucher, he says, would make the difference between stable poverty and grinding poverty. I, I like that 
difference. He's not saying that people won't be poor, but stable poverty is something that you can work in and thrive in. Grinding property poverty is this thing that Arlene is suffering from where she is constantly being uprooted. Housing vouchers could make a difference, but three in four people who qualify for housing assistance do not receive it. Eviction is destabilizing neighborhoods, and rent in poor neighborhoods is not different than rich ones, um, rent in rich ones, and it's generally been the case like this in, since the 19th century. All of these are social constructs. These are bits of reality, but they're social reality, not physical reality, um, which means that they fall under the purview of political responsibility. All right, so that's all I've got for this week. And um, next week, we're going to actually read more um, from Iris Marion Young and uh, more in Evicted.